Hello, everyone, and good afternoon. And thanks to all of you for joining us. My name is Gabriela Sanchez, and I'm a senior researcher with the Migration and Global Order Unit here at the Danish Institute for International Studies. So thank you so much to all of you for joining us today. Um, for what promises to be a very interesting webinar and conversation with our colleagues from several locations around the world. And that is going to involve the discussion of this new um, this report um, that was also coordinating in collaboration with the Danish um, Red Cross. Does information save migrants' lives? So you can actually go to the this website and download your copy. We'll be, um, you know, really grateful and very much looking forward. We look forward to your comments and feedback. Um, we have a very busy agenda for today, so let's go ahead and get get started with some of the general housekeeping details. Um, my friend and colleague um, Achman Schmeli is on the chat, where you're going to be able to um, post some of your questions, so that and and you can please please feel free to post them as we go so that at the end of the, the conversation, at the end of the panels, we can just go right into them. Um, let me see if there's any other quick messages. Um, my colleagues just posted the link to the report on the chat box. So once again, feel free to go there and download it. And, um, mm -hmm. hello? Let's go ahead and, and get started so that we don't, um, so that we can get to, all of our wonderful presenters and um, have our conversation with you following that. So first, um, the agenda is going to be uh, Sine Ide Anderson. She is the head of international programs for the Danish Red Cross, and she is going to be discussing the research collaboration um, with this and uh, in preparation for this report. So um, Sine, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Gabriela. Um, I'm uh, super happy to be uh, part of this uh, seminar here today and uh, share with you a few remarks of uh, introduction. Um, as a humanitarian organization, Danish Red Cross is uh, committed to humanitarian impact and to inspire and act for human dignity, resilience and social cohesion where people are affected by conflict, natural disaster, persecution and inequality. And uh, in the context where we work, not least in the Sahel, we are faced with increasing complexity and challenges. In the Red Cross, we constantly look for ways to overcome these challenges and find new answers for improving our work. And we do this, for example, through partnerships that can strengthen our knowledge and uh, understanding. So let me just, uh, I want to share with you also just a small PowerPoint here, a picture. Um, our cooperation with uh, the Danish Institute of International Studies started in uh, 2018 um, and is one of such partnerships. Uh, it has a specific focus on the area of migration. The partnership has clearly proven that cooperation between academia and humanitarian actors is beneficial to both parties in applied learning. It bridges research and operational experiences for us. It allows for critical reflection on what we think are known truths, and it allows us to open our eyes to new understandings. Danish Red Cross has in the recent years increased and strengthened its work on migration, focusing on saving lives, addressing basic needs, ensuring safe and resilient living and promoting social inclusion. And since 2018, this has been rolled out through two major regional programs developed and implemented with our local host Red Cross, Red Crescent National Societies in East and West Africa. Through our programs and also through this cooperation with, uh, with DEES, we have 
achieved a deeper insight into some of the specific areas we focus on. And to give a few examples, a review of the challenges and experiences of young male returnees to Ethiopia led to awareness of men's vulnerabilities and needs. And it led to adjusting our approach to, for instance, psychosocial support. Another brief um, that was made by, by Dees in this partnership focused on internally displaced populations living in formal settlements on the outskirts of Bamako in Mali. And that gave us insight into their daily struggles with access to services and to their agency hopes and perspectives. While strengthening how we work, the insights also served the purpose of providing solid documentation for advocacy on humanitarian needs. Um, the brief in Mali was, for instance, used in connection with the, the senior official meeting and pledging conference last year on Central Sahel. So, I'm just sorry, trying to shift to the next. There we go. So, Danish Red Cross has a uh, long-standing experience uh, with partners in addressing humanitarian needs in West Africa. And these experiences have been the backbone of starting this major regional program in 2018, 18, addressing migrants' needs while in transit in the region or upon return to their country of origin. Tina, we are looking at a black screen. Oh, <laughs> I'm sorry. We need to Let see another slide. Again. What about now? Yeah, can you make it full screen then? Yeah, that was what I did and then it went black. But anyway, let's hope. Let's try again then. Yeah, now we see it. <laughs> Super. So Red Cross and Red Crescent um, never works to, uh, to, to discourage or encourage migration. That is an individual choice, um, but preferably also an informed decision. Um, Red Cross contributes to reduce vulnerability and to protection along the migratory routes, which we all know have been increasingly dangerous over the past few years. Information on risks and rights and where and how to seek assistance along the routes is a really a key component in reducing vulnerabilities and have therefore been a key part of program activities contributing to migrants' opportunities to make informed decisions for themselves. So when uh, Dees presented the idea of looking into tracing information and information gaps in uh, West African migrants' decision-making, it was an excellent opportunity to have this deeper insight, this deeper or critical reflection about our known truths into what kind of information migrants look for and where they look for it and how migrants perceive themselves and how they perceive us as humanitarian actors. And clearly, um, as we will hear today, there are new knowledge in this study that can help us to reflect and adjust our programs. Red Cross, Red Crescent colleagues participated in the collection of data and this was an additional benefit for us, working with a different set of questions and approach to data collection than normally we do. Um, and therefore, it actually also led to a competence building and new insights uh, to, uh, to the way we work and to our programs. So from the Red Cross, we are very pleased with the opportunity to discuss the findings of this study. And uh, you will hear much more also from some of my colleagues who took part in the study and the, their experience from the region. So thank you so much and uh, looking forward to the rest of the, of the afternoon. Thank you so much, Sina, for your, your remarks. We are really grateful and look forward to continuing the partnership. And um, next we will you know, move right into the presentation of the report. And for that, we are going to have two of the um, researchers who collaborated and coordinated in preparation for the report. 
They are my friends and colleagues, um, Ida Marie um, Savio Baman and Cine Plambeck. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you, Gabriela. Well, first of all, great to see you all. So many of you online here today. We truly appreciate your interest in the event and uh, the launch of our new report. Today, Cine Plambeck and I will present the report's main findings and address the dilemma it raises. Although we present today, it's really the result of a collaborative process that also involves uh, these researchers, Alam Chimlali and Nina Nubert Sørensen, but also Brian Brady and Nabil, uh, Nabil sorry, uh, Fadosi, who is here today, and Hadja Asira and Katarina Alves. We hope that our presentation can serve as an appetizer for you to dig more into our work and read the report online. Hopefully, we can together with our, discuss, uh, with our discussion today spark debate and inform humanitarian practitioners and policymakers about how to better understand and assist migrants who end up in vulnerable situations en route. Information campaigns to discourage young Africans from migrating to Europe have become an increasingly popular policy measure, especially in the wake of the 2015 refugee crisis. Similarly, humanitarian organizations like the Red Cross promote information hoping to decrease African migrants' vulnerability and save lives along the most used migration routes to Europe. But what kind of information do migrants themselves rely on? Whom do they trust and why? And what can we learn from their experiences en route? This has been some of the guiding questions for the report that focuses on how West African migrants select, access and use information when leaving their home community and while moving along the often dangerous migration routes to North Africa or Europe. The report main findings build on 71 in-depth qualitative interviews with male and female West African migrants in six countries, interviewed at different points along their journey or conducted after the return. They had all traveled along the changing routes to North Africa or Europe to work, and in some cases to seek asylum within the past years. For the vast majority, it was the first time they had attempted international migration. They left due to unstable economic conditions, poor job opportunities, and disillusionment with future livelihood possibilities at home. But conflict and political instability were also a pivotal force behind some of the migrants' decision to go. On average, they spent two years en route before reaching countries in North Africa or Europe or before they returned without having realized their initial migration plans. Border crossings often poses numerous barriers for the migrants, primarily due to the increase in target operations to stop unwanted migration put in place by EU African agreements and also the worsening local security situations. In this context, migrants' journey are increasingly becoming longer and more precarious, raising the demand for smugglers who can assist them in overcoming such hindrances. Though the number of migrant crossings to Europe from Africa has been reduced since uh, 2015, the land and sea routes from Af African countries to Europe continues to be among the most dangerous and lethal in the world. But coming back to the question of how West African migrants select access and use information, we can see that while some migrants spend months and years preparing and saving money for the journey, others leave with little or no preparation. However, an apparent lack of preparation is often related to situ situations of personal or social political emergency that require immediate departure. The migrants see information about the journey ahead as a crucial part of the planning, especially when trying to identify the safest and fastest route or where to find the best smugglers. When preparing to go, the information migrants seek most is related to the risk and dangers, the challenges of border crossings, the location of border and militia checkpoints, more practical challenges related to the desert crossing, and knowing where to find work en route. Not surprisingly, 
the report shows that migrants use information they trust. And this information largely come from people within their close social networks consisting of friends and family or extended networks in the country or abroad that have migration experience or possess particular knowledge about migration. Before going and while traveling, they remain key sources of trusted information. Yet the migrants network also expand when they embark on their journey. While language, ethnicity, and to a lesser degree, religion seem to be important in the initial phase of trust building with other people in route, sharing the same experience, information, and resources is also stressed as highly important. So fellow migrants are therefore often mentioned as trusted. But our data also shows that smugglers are among the most trusted source of information, despite being considered biased and self-interested and sometimes potentially dangerous. So when accessing information about migration, migrants mainly use face-to-face -face interactions or telephone calls, but WhatsApp and Facebook are also popular and inexpensive ways of making calls, sharing voice message, messages and uh, texting. Only rarely do migrants search for information about migration from online websites. And our study shows that the extent to which migrants can afford, know of, and use phones and the internet is highly dependent on access to financial resources, mobile connection, and importantly, the migrants' digital literacy. Overall, we can say that the migrants have knowledge about logistics and the risk of their travel, yet they also point to important knowledge gaps in regard to the presence of detention centers in Algeria, migrant rights in general, updates on the current situation in route, the presence of armed groups, the harsh conditions for migrants in camps, and the reality of the sea crossings from Morocco to Spain or from Libya to Italy. Although information and awareness campaigns have been widespread throughout West Africa for many years, Far from all migrants in the study have been exposed to such campaigns. Those who were exposed encounter them through radio, television, or community events. While some migrants found them useful, they also stress that they did not take them seriously, noting that their drive to leave was much stronger than any possible effort to dissuade them from going. Combined with results from other studies, this suggests that traditional information and awareness campaigns are not very likely to make people reconsider their migration plans. Yet proper information about the security situation, concrete dangers and challenges in route, and where to find humanitarian aid and work would make the migrants less vulnerable and capable of making safer decisions on whether to return, stay put, or move on. And I will now give the word to Sine, who will uh, go through the last part of our report. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ida. Let me begin briefly with COVID, which obviously shaped the making of the report and the lives of the migrants this past year. And uh, some of my colleagues uh, will later talk more about COVID. Um, but uh, obviously, COVID amplified already known vulnerabilities for migrants on the move. And the pandemic resulted in border closures and a reshuffling of migration routes. Some ended up paying infl inflated prices to smugglers to take them to other and new destinations. For instance, as we have seen recently, the reopened old route to the Canary Islands. Beyond the limited access to health services and livelihoods, migrants also highlight the various ways in which xenophobia has increased in the wake of the pandemic, such as accusations that migrants bring the virus across borders. The precarious situation and reduced flow of migrants due to border closures have further gender-specific effects on female migrants, as we also uh, discussed with the interviews in the, uh, during the report. And more broadly, uh, speaking pre-COVID well too, some of these vulnerabilities and abuses along the routes are highly gendered. 
so we tried to look into what some of the the women, those who are often considered the most vulnerable, what their uh, experiences were. So of all of the 26 women that we interviewed, uh, they had all experienced a witness sexual violence either at the Moroccan Algerian border in transit in Tunisia, across the desert to Niger, and or in Libyan detention centers. And these vulnerabilities and abuses included rape, high levels of maternal and infant mortality, uh, limited access to contraception and pregnancy termination. Migrant women mentioned uh, uh, that when they are in irregular immigration status, they are often excluded from maternal health care. And when it comes to information, they stress that they need assistance um, and information about reproductive health care, access to contraceptives, birth control, sanitary pads, and the need for safe spaces only for women. What they mentioned also was that uh, the fear of deportation and detention deterred the women from reporting sexual abuse and rape to the local authorities and humanitarian organizations. And this pointed to a broader issue, the issue of trust uh, in the humanitarian um, encounter. Throughout our interviews, trust and distrust emerge as key factors in explaining migrants' reasons for accepting, declining, or avoiding available uh, assistance and, and seek information. Several migrants explain that they often do not seek professional medical assistance or other types of humanitarian assistance due to their lack of trust and their fears of arrest, detention, and deportation. Many migrants further associate some humanitarian actors along the route with encouragement to return home and discouragement from continuing the migration journey. Migrants who express this distrust in humanitarian organizations had often been warned by other migrants and migration brokers that they met uh, on the way. This issue of trust occurred uh, because local uh, and migration authorities can be present at sites where humanitarian actors are also working. So that's one reason. And another explanation is a lack of clarity regarding who is who among the various humanitarian organizations that are present in the borderlands, often with different agendas. Uh, and one of the women that we interviewed had met more than 11 different uh, actors on, on the way. Um, so, so uh, of course, we can understand that it, that could be confusing. Uh, but primarily, the issue of trust is linked to fears of return and deportation. Uh, and that caused a, a dilemma uh, in this um, humanitarian encounter. Because although returns uh, are framed as humanitarian acts and stress that they should be voluntary and dignified, uh, for instance, the returns from Libya back to uh, different West African countries, it appears from the interviews that migrants perceive some assistance as discouragement and ultimately deportation uh, rather uh, than as rescue and assistance. As such, they collide uh, with migrants' goals of reaching North Africa or Europe. By contrast, as Ida also mentioned briefly we, uh, briefly, we found a general high degree of trust in the information received from smugglers, despite the mixed experiences of violence and deception. This contrasts with the current European policy debates where migrant smugglers are often only portrayed as mafia-like criminals who put migrants' lives at risk. In this way, our findings challenge this one-sided narrative of the smuggler when in fact the migrants also use information from smugglers to avoid the abuses of local authorities and avoid deportations and returns. This one-sided focus on smugglers in current European policy debate and border control measures tend to overshadow and mute how other actors uh, conduct, conduct violent abuses. Apart from the smugglers, migrants point to abuse, abuses by local and national authorities, including security forces, the police, border uh, control officials, and the military. A sensitive dilemma then is how humanitarian actors who want to assist and protect migrants along the routes should collaborate with authorities that are part of the business and often gatekeepers, um, even though they are a part of irregular migration and are responsible for human rights violations. So that one of the dilemma we could maybe discuss later. Um, and to start wrapping up, our title polemically asks, will more information save migrants' lives? 
Uh, an overall conclusion of this report is that while the EU and European states have invested in information campaigns aimed at discouraging migrants uh, for more than two decades, migrants generally do not consider them useful when they encounter them. This is mainly because they do not give people on the move what they consider to be useful and concrete information on other livelihood possibilities of risk reducing information. Moreover, they are already well aware of the risks and dangers associated with migration and do not want to be discouraged from making their journeys. Migration from West African countries um, is a part of, of many families' livelihood strategies, and it is a, therefore not surprising that migrants trust and rely on sources that confirm their positive views of migration, despite the struggles that they might face. Working with the strengths rather than the vulnerabilities of migrants is therefore key in information campaigns uh, and in the um, attempts to assist and provide information, because information alone does not reduce harm and vulnerabilities. And finally, information in the context of migration is often perceived as one directional as going from the organization to the migrants. Uh, but we tried to flip that perspective a bit and then we asked the migrants to provide information to the organizations. Um, so Amelia, maybe you will put up uh, a slide um, and then I will end by showing you migrants own advice uh, to uh, humanitarian organizations and to other um, migrants. And they are, uh, do not travel with a lot of money as you risk being robbed. Avoid IOM and other NGOs because you cannot know if they will repatriate you. Give information about dangers, but not discouragement. Try to go the legal way. More information about where to find humanitarian actors. Better access to basic services such as food, water, shelter, and cash cards. Special units that can rescue migrants in urgent need provide access to healthcare services and psychosocial support. And we also ask specifically the women and they ask for special health kits, reproductive care and access to abortion for women that can be assessed without the involvement of local authorities, safe spaces and need for spaces where migrants can share information, again, not to have this uh, one directional uh, share, uh, information share. And then finally, help to find jobs as well as legal pathways to documents and residents. And by that, I will end. Thank you so much, Sine and Ida Marie for the, this excellent summary of the report and for bringing up precisely the need for more nuanced analysis into not only the gender specific challenges that are involved in the, the route, but also the kinds of interactions that people develop along the route, you know, when this more critical take on the role of smuggling facilitators, you know, that is urgently needed. Um, next, we are going to move to examine the current protection challenges for African migrants in polling route with some of the collaborators for the report. So first we have uh, Sisi Seku, a migration delegate with the Project Amira in the, that with the Danish, Danish Red Cross. So the floor is yours. Uh, hi everybody. Uh, I'm very, very uh, proud and happy to be, uh, to share uh, with you our little experience in uh, Sahel, uh, particularly in, in Niger. And my, my name is Sepu Sisi and the, I, I'm the migration program delegate in AMIRA. That means AMIRA means uh, action for migrant uh, uh, assistance to migrant route based, uh, action for migrant route based assistance. Uh, I have the pleasure to share with you two reflections. The first one is about the political situation in Niger. And the second one is the categories of migrant we, we, we are facing and what what were the challenges in 2020 according to COVID-19 outbreak? Uh, let me, at the first of all, start with the uh, situation, the political situation. And uh, rem uh, remember you that the EU-led migration control measures have, have had an, an impact in, um, on migration flows. And even if the flows are re reduced, Statically, 
uh, according to official statistics, it must be acknowledged that the humanitarian challenges remain multiple and huge and very, very complex. Why? First of all, we, we are facing to a multiplication of secondary routes, which are very, very dangerous for migrants. And some of routes are, are, are really, really dangerous because they can uh, lose their life, unfortunately. Um, the second is the increase of means of transport, which force some, some, some of them to stay longer to continue. continue. They stay in uh, principal cities like Niamey and Zander and uh, Agadezut also. It should be noted that women are very, very vulnerable, vulnerable due to the sex, sexual exploitation, uh, exploitation, which leads to either STDs and unwanted pregnancy, which also raise the child protection issues. Also, the situation increased the cases of trafficking and the multiplication of trafficking networks, which are manifested by the exaction in Libya and in the desert of uh, uh, Niger also and uh, Algeria also. And we are facing to that uh, and other, uh, all the social media are showing every, uh, every day is really, really the situation. The difficulty of accessing to basic social services, especially uh, to for health, health and uh, SVBG services. Even if in theory, migrants have rights because they are from ECOWAS zone. In, real, in, in reality, their reception in public structures is different, a kind of stigmatization. And we have also, we are also facing uh, to another challenge is this, uh, the, uh, uh, that is uh, the social inclusion and integration of mig migrants who wish to uh, stay in, uh, for example, in Niger. Uh, we have many, many migrants who decided to, 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 uh, to, to stay and find some, some job or for opportunity, but they don't have competencies or they don't have means to, to be uh, a part of this uh, community here. And that is the challenge. And the last challenge is about child protection. As you know, some of women have problems and they have child uh, and uh, the, these child are not, uh, don't have uh, access to many, many services like uh, self, uh, health services, scholarship, or education services. And the second point is about the category of migrant, specifically for Amira. We, we don't have, we, we have two big categories of migrants in Niger. The first one is the migrants in transit, mainly coming from uh, ECOWAS uh, countries like Liberia, Mali, Guinea, uh, Gambia, Ivory Coast, uh, or, or Senegal. They are composed of men and women. women. They are subdivided in three subcategories. The first one is uh, those on the road to departure. The second, on, uh, the second is those in transit for an average period of three months or three months. And C, those who have returned, mostly rejected by Algeria authorities or Libya. The second group is Nigerian citizens, because uh, facing to climate change, we observe that some community, uh, mainly women and children, choose to migrate for to migrate for Algeria. This type of migration is seasonal. It allows community to be more resilient to climate change. But the two categories, both categories share some roots and vulnerability along the way, and they are often subject of 
mass reformment uh, uh, by Algerian authorities. And the, about the challenges uh, during the year 20, 2020, the closure of the border means migrants remain stranded for months without resources in Niamey's and there or Agadez. Migrants live on daily work and meet their basic needs. And it is some, sometimes difficult for, the, for them to find a job because of the, the pressure in Niger. And the women also who live from sex work or bus workers or restaurant workers have seen their living condition and those who their children deteriorate. And Amira program has to set up a voucher system to support most of them. And uh, one uh, monthly based, they can come or we can, we can wish them to give them a little voucher to be uh, to make them uh, able to find something to eat. Uh, the overcrowding in French, la promiscuité, in the accommodation has increased the risk of a COVID-19 infection, but it was not possible uh, to measure that because they don't have access to, to tests or to treatments. But we, it is an hypothesis because uh, there are 10 or, or 11 or 20 in, uh, in the same compound. This proximity can bring uh, both some health issues, especially uh, the COVID-19. And according to their life condition also, the stigma, their access uh, and stigma, they don't have easy access to health facilities. And that's why the Amira program deploy the mobile cleaning clinic to, and strengthen the, um, the referencement to health facilities, our government has health facilities with uh, staff and uh, volunteers accompaniment. Also, the pandemic added the stress of migrants already living with uh, trauma of the road. And uh, Amira has continued to strengthen the PSS activities and offering possibility to call volunteers for further support. If the migrants uh, need support, we opened uh, a line to allow them to, uh, to call for, uh, Red Cross volunteers and to discuss and to uh, find for support. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Here, fighting with the computer for a little bit. Thank you so much to say for your, your presentation and also for highlighting how all of this precarity, how all of these challenges are not inherent or natural to migrants, but they also emerge, you know, in terms of given the route and the, the conditions that they face in their in the context of their journeys. So next we have joining us from Morocco, uh, Nabil Ferdosi, you know, who was also a collaborator in the report. So we'll give him the floor next. Nabil. Thank you, Gabriella. Uh, it's really a pleasure to be part of this launch event. Uh, yes, indeed, the, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic has amplified the existing vulnerabilities uh, uh, in West Africa and uh, as well as North Africa. Uh, so particularly migrants from, from these regions uh, uh, were stuck in these countries, particularly North Africa, while they are uh, caught by the, by the effect of the pandemic. So the, the vulnerabilities uh, are at all levels, uh, transportation, health, uh, economy, uh, and everything. So, uh, actually, not not partly the pandemic, but also the uh, the uh, the, uh, the policies and the measures taken by the by, for example, uh, in Morocco, uh, amplified the the vulnerabilities of migrants uh, because many many of the, of the policies taken do not consider the uh, the the existence of not nationals, but they were particularly uh, assigned to people who are in the country. So, for example, uh, to 
to manage the pandemic, uh, Morocco established the, the special fund that uh, reimbursed people who lost their jobs. So, for example, migrants were not able to benefit from this. So, many migrants lost their uh, unskilled jobs they do, uh, or people who were begging in the street uh, could no longer beg or find a, a, a source of living in the country. Uh, but also travel bans uh, uh, in, in the country that uh, hindered the intercity movement uh, greatly impacted the, uh, the travel and the, uh, the journeys of migrants. So, for example, migrants who were stuck uh, in the north of Morocco were unable to, to come all the way to the south of Morocco where, uh, where the mobility has, has been intensified due to the, to the rapid reshuffling of migratory routes. Uh, towards the Canary Islands. So many of these migrants, uh, as a result of, of intercity uh, travel bans, paid unreasonable prices to smugglers to take them a few kilometers from the north to the south. Uh, and this actually exacerbated uh, their, their vulnerabilities. Uh, and at the same time, people uh, with, with diseases or with, uh, with illness could not have access to to public health centers during to the to the to racial profiling and due to fear to be deported. So many migrants preferred to consult pharmacists rather than go going to the uh, to, to to public health health centers. Uh, so they were afraid uh, to be called that they, they they caught the virus and then they will be taken or will be deported. So there is this lack of trust in the, uh, in the public uh, in public health centers. So many people prefer to stay home uh, and opt for unprofessional uh, alternatives or either consult a pharmacist. This would be the, the best way. And at the same time, people uh, could not go outside because during, uh, during, the, during the, the lockdown period, uh, many migrants uh, used to do some unskilled jobs uh, could not go to their jobs and people who big could not have, could not at the same time go outside to big uh, due to the lockdown measures particularly in some cities in the north but for example in cities in the south of Morocco people uh, migrant migrant people can, can go on the street uh, uh, when it comes to the uh, to the uh, to the trust dynamics between migrants and local NGOs, we find that uh, migrants uh, react to these NGOs in a different manner, for example, because they, they know through their established networks which, uh, which uh, local NGO or migrant community they have to, uh, to seek assistance from, for example. Uh, they would go to migra migrant communities where, where they, they know uh, fellow nationals or friends or community members rather than go to local NGOs uh, because as a matter of fact some NGOs use migration uh, uh, as, as a uh, for beneficial personal benefits uh, rather than for uh, as a uh, as a serious issue so migrants do not trust uh, local NGOs that much but Certainly, but during the pandemic, uh, many NGOs played a great role in assisting these migrants because uh, there has been a total disengagement from from governments in the in the region, uh, and they 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 really they were a, a lifeline for many vulnerable migrants uh, through uh, to the distribution of food supplies. Uh, uh, hygienic and sanitary product to protect migrants from infection. Uh, and also they played a great role, uh, an intermediary, intermediary role between local authorities uh, and uh, uh, migrants. Uh, for example, in mid-June when, when uh, many migrants tested positive in, in the south of Morocco, uh, some migrant communities and migrant activists and NGO members were called upon to, to intermediate between local authorities and medical crews because many of them 
refused, did not accept the idea of be, uh, to be quarantined and take medicine. So they were uh, considering quarantine, quarantine rules as, as, a, as a detention center or something like that. So uh, there was a lack of communication and lack of trust. And this trust was regained thanks to, the, to some local NGO members and to, to, uh, uh, to, to migrants activists who are themselves uh, play a huge role in regaining distrust. Uh, one of the problems of, of this humanitarian assistance uh, that uh, these NGOs suffer from, first, the, they, are, they are small scale. The, the, the number of migrants is, is, is huge and the food supplies and these are very small in scale. So they were not able to cover all the migrants that are in need. The second thing is that the, the, the lockdown measures, uh, many NGO members could not access at-risk migrants who, who live in forests and makeshift camps due to the lockdown measures. So they were monitored by local authorities. So this was also a great, a huge problem uh, that hindered this humanitarian uh, processes uh, but particularly in, in the north of Morocco, they were not they were not allowed to enter forests, uh, particularly during the first months of the pandemic. But later on, they could they could uh, they could really provide that. Uh, thank you. That was it for my part. Thank you so much, Nabil, for this important information and from being our eyes on the ground. So thank you so much. Um, in the following part of the seminar, we are going to try to explore some of the ways in which organizations, humanitarian um, institutions, have developed you know, ways to better assist and share vital information to migrant people as they travel. So for that, we have invited our colleagues, Amy Schmitz, uh, she's the research lead at CIFAR, and Brian Brady for the migration. He was the migration and displacement coordinator for the Danish Refugee Council to have a conversation with us today. So uh, first, Amy, <laughs> and I know that you have been recently involved in research looking into the best practices for um, communications that are related to migration. So you know, uh, we'll give you the floor so that you can uh, go over some of them with us next. Happy to, yes. I think I, I want to draw actually on two separate pieces of research and just explore some of the what I think um, you know, key challenges are really um, in providing information, but also in providing assistance to migrants on the route. Um, the first piece of research is a study that CIFA completed in a consortium called IMREF um, for the UK FCDO. And that one specifically focused on uh, trust in humanitarian organizations, but predominantly on providing direct assistance to migrants in transit rather than um, yeah, purely focused on information. And the second study is one on um, information campaigns specifically, as you said, where we interviewed um, nearly 1000 potential migrants and migrants in transit and actually also looked at um, information 20 information campaigns over the last two years to try and better identify you know what works and, and perhaps doesn't work so well in those uh, campaigns the stu two studies overlap a little bit um, but I think they both point to the fact um, that I think the key challenges really boil down to the lack of trust um, it sounds quite common sense and Zina already mentioned this as, as part of you know your report but if we understand why trust is an issue, I think we can also work towards um, perhaps improving these trust levels and overcoming the challenges that are also associated with that. Um, I do wanna focus a little bit more on you know, the migrants perspective, how they perceive trust, how they see trust in organizations, and then coming back what that means for humanitarian organizations kind of as, as a second point. Um, so in the IMREF study on trust that we did, we actually found that migrants' trust in humanitarian organizations was um, quite mixed. And generally, I would say perhaps a little bit lower than, than what the, um, this report uh, mentioned. 
roughly one third of our respondents actually said quite straight out that they had relatively low levels of trust and slightly more than one third were mixed or undecided. But then when we explored that with them a little bit further, um, you could see that they also tended to have more negative views of organizations. And then a sizable group, 25%, also said that they had um, high levels of trust, which I think is definitely you know, good to hear. But we're focusing a little bit more now on that um, quite, quite large group that had low trust levels to understand why that was. And I think that actually did come down to a couple of you know, specific fears or beliefs, some of which were already mentioned by Ida Marie and Sine. Um, and uh, I just want to extend on that a little bit. The first one, which was already mentioned, um, that kind of shaped trust, I would say, was the fear of being deported, especially because respondents in our study actually ended up conflating quite a bit, you know, organizations that focus on providing direct assistance and humanitarian relief with organizations that focus on return. So similar to what your study found. Um, and that also aligns with one of the recommendations that the migrants gave to you, Sina, that you presented at the end of, of your my, um, presentation, I think. The second one is that um, many believe that organizations would prevent them from continuing their journeys, um, either by being reported to local police, which they thought often went hand in hand, um, or by focusing on trying to stop them from, from migrating. And then the third factor here, was that they thought they would actually be treated quite poorly potentially if they were to access services from humanitarian organizations. And one specific concern that was mentioned here, which I find interesting was um, that many actually said, my anonymity is gonna be breached. Um, people are gonna take photographs of me and then put that on outward facing PR materials, which definitely impacted their trust levels. So we know that trust levels are relatively low, and that that is focused on some very specific fears and beliefs. Um, but we also wanted to understand more specifically where those fears and beliefs came from. Um, and we identified four um, factors. The first one sounds relatively simple again, but it came back to past experiences with these organizations, um, either their own personal experiences or stories of what they had heard from people in their networks. Um, so the more negative individual experiences were, the more negative um, these interactions were, the more negative the trust levels, of course, ended up being as well, which I think is an interesting challenge to look at in a moment. The second was knowledge of what the organizations actually do. Um, so the higher the knowledge level, uh, the higher the trust levels and vice versa. The third was perceptions of neutrality of organizations, specifically in reacting to people's migration plans. Um, so the more favorable or neutral these organizations were perceived to be, um, the more trusted they were. And again, vice versa as well. And then the final point there is in our information campaigns um, in the research on that, we found that specifically for information, the lack of tailored and individualized information also really reduced trust um, simply because it wasn't perceived to be relevant if it was a one size fits all approach. So now turning that back around, what does that mean for humanitarian organizations and what, what are their challenges? I think just in that kind of very distrustful environment, Providing any form of information or assistance is quite unlikely to just work smoothly, let alone be effective. So you have to address those challenges in, in some way. And I think we can combine the things I mentioned in terms of the migrants' views on trust into two particular challenges for organizations. And the first is um, the lack of trust because migrants had negative experiences with them in the past. I think that's a challenge that organizations um, have probably faced quite often and something that they also can work on, on addressing potentially. And the second one is the lack of trust because migrants might be unaware of what it is that these organizations actually do. And because they think that organizations are not necessarily neutral in how they provide assistance or react to migration plans, which I think is the second, second big challenge here that, that could potentially be overcome. Now, I don't want to leave you hanging here. I just want to 
um, give you some ideas that we came up with in terms of strategies for how to then also address these challenges. And I think we identified four that I think might be worth sharing in this forum. The first is again, relatively simple and you would think that organizations are doing this, but they might not be doing it to the extent that's actually needed. Um, and that's really training staff, especially those who directly engage with migrants because they are the ones who shape those individual experiences I talked about a moment ago. So trainings, it, it comes back to that training for field staff, especially on you know, effective neutrality on how they communicate with migrants on organizations neutrality, on things like the rights to anonymity. And even something as simple as you know, the, the voluntary nature of, the, of accessing these support services. The second is that organizations could perhaps explore a little bit more how to you know, advocate publicly or communicate openly positions against deportations and in favor of regular migration. And then also making it very clear or as clear as possible that assistance and return are not the same thing and they are not you know, mutually dependent basically. And then the third one would be information on, on their services. So what is it that they actually do? Can they do a better job at more openly communicating what it is that they offer and perhaps also why? Um, and then sharing that not only with the migrants, but also with key actors, that's you know families, other migrants, um, but also as the report pointed out, uh, smuggling actors who are key gatekeepers that have to be involved in some way or another in information provision. And then the last one is um, focused on peer-to-peer -peer and individualized information sharing strategies. So these are um, very likely to be more trusted. In fact, our information campaign found that they were the second most likely to actually change how migrants think about irregular migration just after providing home country opportunities. So looking at that a little bit more and how to use individualized one-on-one -on -one approaches to communicate information that really matters to the individual migrant um, can potentially be something that organizations can, can explore a little bit more. Um, for that last element, just two final notes from my end. Um, we actually found that local organizations, and I think someone asked this question in the QA, um, are not necessarily more trusted than international organizations especially when it came to direct assistance. So the situation might look a little bit different when it comes to pure information, um, but for direct assistance, international organizations actually seem to be trusted a little bit more because they were thought to have more resources. Um, so including them doesn't necessarily solve the trust issue. And then the last one is to adopt a multi-stakeholder approach when you do do information sharing, because we also found that either conflicting information or even too much information would actually end in a reverse reversal of the uh, trust mechanisms that you can be putting in place. Perfect. Well, thank you so much for again, this great presentation and for reminding us that you know, information alone you know, does not necessarily reduce vulnerability. So thank you so much. Um, so I guess we'll next move to Brian who also played a key role in data collection and the preparation of the report. The floor is yours. Great, thank you very much. And good afternoon, good evening to everybody. Um, so yeah, my name is Brian, just a small correction. Um, I'm actually Migration Displacement Coordinator with Danish Red Cross and IFRC, not the other uh, DRC. Um, so, Actually, Amy, I'm really happy to hear what you say um, because it, it really resonates with what this study found. And actually as well with the two questions that I'm going to look at today, which are, what are the main lessons learned from this project when thinking about how to strengthen trust and information with migrants? And also moving forward, what can humanitarian actors do differently when assisting and informing migrants on route? So for the first question, what are the lessons learned and how can we strengthen trust and information with uh, information sharing with migrants? My first point is, um, and as Amy touched upon already a bit, um, how an organization works with migration, this is noticed and it does have an impact. 
What we see in this research is that many migrants avoided humanitarian organizations while traveling north, believing that these organizations might seek to influence their decisions or send them back home. Um, from my experience working with Danish Red Cross in Guinea, and from what I know from other countries in West Africa who are working with migration programming, uh, they succeeded to gain a very high level of trust with migrants, both with returnees and those on the move. And this is largely, I believe, due to Red Cross's focus on humanitarian needs and also combined with their unique network working through volunteers, which is having a very local community level engagement. Another point that I think is quite important is that um, the difference between different actors is maybe not always clear. Uh, continued skepticism by migrants towards humanitarian actors is likely. There are humanitarian actors which do participate in the return of migrants or do have an overt focus on the dangers or negatives of, of migration without speaking on how to keep people safe. This may be seen as propaganda by those who see migration as a solution for themselves and their families. The differences in humanitarian actors' way of working, their ethos, their principles are often not understood by migrants and subsequently they avoid all actors in the belief that they will only seek to convince them to go home or actively take part in returning them home. This unfortunately leads to undue risk for migrants as they miss out on access to essential services, including humanitarian assistance, uh, support with reconnecting with their families, uh, psychosocial support, health services, and others which might otherwise be freely available to them. As such, it's really essential that we have an increased effort to ensure that there is a recognition in the difference between actors and how they work so that migrants do not miss out on this potentially life-saving services. There, in my opinion, there's really no clear and cut path to achieving this, particularly considering as we've seen um, the challenges around perception of information campaigns by migrants. But careful and focused com communication and advocacy could support the, to change the tide in this regard. Uh, consistent advocacy through action as well and ensuring visibility would also be an excellent long-term strategy for building trust with migrants and, and communities. And when I say advocacy through action, I mean building up a reputation by providing consistent services. When a migrant comes to a Red Cross branch or a humanitarian service point, they know what to expect, know that they will have access to basic services such as restoring family links, they will have access to a referral network for services that Red Cross cannot provide, and that they will, and that they know that they will be in a neutral and safe environment regardless of their migration status. The next question, um, moving forward, what can we as humanitarian actors do when assisting and informing migrants en route? My first point is, we, sh we need to, we should not assume ignorance. Um, this builds a false perception and creates distrust. I think too often um, we have this incorrect assumption that migrants do not know what is in store for them when migrating. While there might be some truth to this, even through this research, some migrants noted that the journey was more difficult than they expected. We also saw that migrants pre and during their journeys actively contacted acquaintances, family members, and others who already migrated or that they met en route to know how to prepare, how to get advice on how to stay safe, and to be knowledgeable about which routes to take. In this regard, migrants are not seeking information from humanitarian organizations or government sources for the most part, and this doesn't seem exclusive to the West African context. People are rather reaching out to those with like and real migration experiences to get information. Next, I think as we, we underscored already, is to focus on humanitarian need. Uh, there is a long historical and cultural tradition in West Africa around migration, including a long history of work-related seasonal migration to other countries in the region or to North Africa. Migration has long been a mechanism to improve one's situation and to provide for loved ones, and is still seen as exactly this for many people. Unfortunately, current events means that 
these routes have become increasingly dangerous. Rising conflict, insecurity, especially in the Sahel and North Africa, particularly Libya, leads migrants to being exposed more than ever to numerous risks, including exploitation, detention, kidnapping, sexual and gender-based violence, and physical and mental abuses. As humanitarians, it's important that we speak on these risks, of course, but it's also imperative that we inform people on how to protect themselves and stay safe, all while being as realistic, open, and transparent as possible. And this will go a long way to building trust with the people with which we work and to ensure that they feel comfortable coming towards us at any point when they are in need without fear of being lectured, returned home, or reported to authorities. And finally, we need to continue to seek to better understand how migrants look for and use information and work with this. Uh, we need to recognize that us as humanitarian actors, we may never be the ultimate sus trusted source of in information that we aspire to be. Uh, I think we've seen that there is a clear preference to have by migrants to have information from those with like experience to them. So as to say other migrants. Um, we need to continue to explore this trend and to find ways of conveying information to keep individuals safe without creating a perception of propaganda. Working with community leaders, migrant groups, and other peers would be a great way to do this, but we should also, I think as this report shows, consider more unconventional ways of ensuring essential and accurate information reaches migrants such as working with smugglers, which we saw in this report, are often seen as a trusted source of information by many migrants on routes. But we also must admit that this will be a long process um, as we may be building from a place of distrust where humanitarian organizations are seen as something to avoid. It will take time, it will take unrelenting effort, and consistent principled action to show that us as Red Cross and other organizations as well, that we are who we say we are and that we seek only to ensure safety. So my last point would be in a very general sense of, does information save migrant lives? Absolutely, but it matters how we do it. Thank you. Thanks so much, Brian. And thank you and apologies for the categorization of your organization, but you are the Danish Red Cross. Thank you so much. And also for bringing up this very key point, you know, that paternalistic approaches to how people employ information really, you know, are not very conducive of understanding the, the nuances of their experiences. So thank you so much for, for that. Okay, so we have actually an extra couple of minutes for our Q&A, so we'll move right into it. And again, my friend and colleague, Aklam, is monitoring the um, box where all the questions are coming in. So I'll give her the floor next. Aklam? Thank you, thank you, Gabriella. Yes, I've um, been monitoring the chat while listening to your presentation, very insightful presentations, as well as uh, very good questions. Uh, some of them I've already answered, but I have a couple that I would like to um, ask you, the, the panelists. Um, and I think I'll start with, um, there's a question I think for Ida, where it's uh, asked that in the report, migrants data is disaggregated by sex and age, any data information about migrants with disabilities? Yes, yeah, unfortunately, um, well, we none of the our interlocutors was disabled. So we, uh, we don't have data on disabilities in this, um, in our data set. If, if that addresses the question, right? Yes, I think that's very well. And uh, there's also a direct question for uh, Cici, if you're with us. Um, if you could tell us more about the multiplication of secondary roads and the increase of means of transport in Niger, and what are the causes for that? Um, okay, uh, thank you, because, uh, you know, if the, uh, according to the law uh, in French, la loi 3615, 
the, uh, the governor, Niger government, put some disposition to stop the migration, the transport the, uh, uh, of migration by smugglers. And they, they sent some of them in jail because of that. And that's why it was uh, easier for them uh, to, 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 to share secondary routes. The, and these routes are very, very expensive uh, because, because of uh, the, the, the context and the means of tra transport. For example, uh, if the migrants convoy uh, leave, uh, leave um, Nigeria, they have to transit by some villages in Niger where the uh, force group, uh, armed group don't pass because uh, we have some checkpoint inside the desert where all the truck have to pass. But if they control the, 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 this checkpoint, they can go uh, easily uh, for, for the border of Algeria. And this situation make the route very long and very, very dangerous because they don't have a point of water, for example. And then the transport, the, smug uh, the smugglers are obliged to, um, to I, I don't know how to explain that, to multiplicate the transport fee per five or six or seven because they don't have, they have to, to uh, put more, uh, more fuel, take more risk, to be put in jail, they don't they don't need to take easily risk without getting something. That's the reason why um, it's dangerous, and some of them can uh, die inside in, in the desert according to this situation. Unfortunately, yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Cici. Yeah. Um, I have uh, more questions here uh, coming in, and um, there's one I think uh, Amy Schmitz would. If you would answer that regarding uh, the high degree of mistrust and distrust from migrants uh, towards INGOs, uh, the question is what about local CSOs and NGOs? And, and also what about language? We also encountered language barriers in, in our reports in, in terms of non-Francophone migrants in, in Morocco and Tunisia. So maybe you could speak uh, on that. Um, yes, I think I unfortunately don't have very much to add on that point. As I as I mentioned briefly in our trust study, we, we did find that um, local CSOs were uh, not, or local organizations generally were not necessarily more trusted, um, at least when it came to aid provision, precisely because what I mentioned earlier that um, migrants actually thought they had much less resources, so there that was, that was less to get out of these organizations. Um, when it comes to information, I think the picture is looking a little bit different um, because it really depends what local organization you're talking to. And that kind of also addresses um, the, the question on language. There are, for example, some migrant associations, migrant houses, for example, operating in Niger or Mali, um, where members of the population of the country of origin of the migrants are providing help and also providing information. And through different studies, not, not only the trust one that we did now, we've actually found that those play quite a vital role in providing um, assistance and also reducing vulnerability among migrants. So there you, you have an actor who, who speaks kind of the languages that the migrants en route uh, to the North are familiar with and, and have grown up with. They have a cultural affinity and, and they are much more aligned with what the migrants are looking for in terms of information and kind of bridge that gap a little bit. Um, but that's unfortunately all of the information that, that I have on that myself. Thanks, Amy. Um, I have a question also regarding uh, gender and gender differences between information sharing networks, uh, as well as how co-nationality shapes levels of trust and information sharing between migrants. Uh, and I would like to ask that question to Sina Thambek. Yeah, thank you. Um, 
So it didn't appear from the research that we uh, uh, that we have uh, for this report that there was significant differences between um, the networks or the information so that women would you use more or less, um, let's say, technology or other kinds of networks. But there were some significant uh, insights, uh, not only from this report, but also from other findings that women often share information with other women uh, about specific gender issues. So that, for instance, uh, pregnancies, abortions, uh, sexual violence are often kept uh, among, uh, kept close among uh, the women, making it difficult sometimes for um, for humanitarians to uh, to have broader insights into what is going on. And also, some of the the women uh, replied that they would uh, prefer to have more safe spaces along the routes that were only for women. And we know from some of the the um, uh, the housings uh, along the route that uh, the women feel very vulnerable in terms of rape and and uh, and sexual violence. So there were um, when we ask what they would uh, like and what kind of um, um, needs they had, it was these more safe spaces spaces where they would be able to share information with each other. Um, uh, between women, uh, in the question on uh, on the question of co-nationality, uh, it's it it seemed that, for instance, I I have worked primarily with Nigerians that uh, that they would stick very much to um, traveling uh, with uh, other Nigerians and also uh, have much more trust in people from their own home communities and even possible if if it's if, if it was possible for them to travel with people from their home community so i do think that uh, that nationality plays a role in in particular in trust thank you sina uh, we also have questions regarding the the covid situation and how this uh, practices uh, influence border crossing by migrants and a specific question regarding the Canary Islands. Uh, so I think uh, Nebil, because uh, you have conducted the, the field research in the southern part of Morocco, if you could speak uh, briefly on that. Thank you. Yes, indeed. Uh, just recently, <clears throat> around four uh, 4,000 migrants, including Malian and Moroccans, Senegalese and <clears throat> Guinean migrants, are now stuck in the Canary Islands, and they are uh, they are really uh, usable situations. They, they are in camps, a camp that can accommodate around 100 migrants, and you, you can't imagine the uh, <clears throat> the sanitary conditions are they living in these camps. So uh, the uh, the duration of the of the, uh, of the of the of the field research in, uh, in the Canary Islands was conducted uh, during the pinnacle of the uh, of the mobility that last year has seen during September August where when the seas flat and there was a lot of mobility. so my, uh, many of these migrants actually um, uh, some of them were succeeded in that and some actually were subject to to scams. So it was not a, a one-way dimension, but there are also some repercussions. Migrants, uh, uh, alongside the the, uh, the repercussions of the pandemic on their financial and uh, economic, uh, financial and uh, socio, socio situation, uh, the uh, the uh, the relationship of trust and distrust with with uh, smugglers was also tenuous, and many of them actually uh, were. Vulnerable were put in a vulnerable uh, position due to their relationship with smugglers, not not also with humanitarian uh, agencies or local NGOs or anything. But in fact, in the final result, they they uh, they they seek refuge in with humanitarian uh, agencies to help them and to see uh, and also to see where to, to stay for uh, for and to consider return. And according to according to a, a recent report by IOM. Around 68% uh, of migrant returnees are uh, affected by debt. So it's a, uh, it's, a it's a it's a an average of 500 511 uh, euros per migrant. So you can't imagine uh, this and the effects of, uh, of, of, de of indebtedness. And uh, some of them were threatened by their indebtors uh, to death. Uh, 
uh, and now the situation has increased uh, and even changed with the uh, with the season. So now uh, it's not like in the first in the months of August, June, uh, September, where mobility has increased uh, had increased in the Canary Islands. Now the, the focus has shifted to the to North Morocco, where uh, to the Mediterranean uh, route. Uh, because of the uh, of the uh, sea changes that happened there, uh, so it's not it's longer uh, possible to go through that route because through many reasons. Uh, well, but primarily of weather. So, so this also played a huge role. And the second one is the uh, uh, the uh, military uh, installment in the region. So you can find military installment one kilometer to not another so you, it's 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 a little bit uh, not that permeable migrants uh, can no longer find a leeway as it was thank you Nabil. thanks for elaborating on on that um i think we we have do we still have time for questions gabriella we have a couple uh coming in uh some some good questions also regarding um how uh european or the gap between the european political view of information as a tool and the humanitarian approach to information as a tool for migration assistance uh, as well as how european governments continue this funding of information campaigns um, and, and the association as, as also drawn in, in the report. I think maybe Ida or Sine, if you would like to elaborate on that, the question of, yeah, basically this gap between European political view of information as a tool versus the humanitarian approach to migration assistance. Yeah, I think I will leave that to Ida. <laughs> thank you very much for, I think you, you yeah, I don't know uh, actually, uh, uh, how to approach this gap. Uh, yes, Bao, you posed this question, uh, but it's definitely there, right? Be, uh, between as uh, information as a tool of dissuasion and increasingly also, I must say, the, the recent campaigns I followed in, in Senegal in a local context there, it's not only about dissuasion, it's definitely also about a positive rebranding of the uh, West African context as a context where you can actually um, uh, make a good livelihood if you work hard etc although the response from people there are often that that that's what basically they have been trying to a long time already so uh, uh, so you can't just right away rebrand a whole nation and and make people stay in uh, in that way but what we can see that that some of the humanitarian uh, organizations also uh, actually approach information in much of the same way. They do want to dissuade people from going because it is extremely dangerous. Um, so there are definitely overlapping uh, views on uh, information. I don't know if I answered the question. Elsewhere, we can keep the conversation in an email. Can I take a stab as well? Yes, please, Amy, go ahead. Um, I think one of the things that we found when looking at, you know, what works and what doesn't work in information campaigns specifically, is that these types of objectives are often not really clear to the actors who are actually involved in information dissemination. So they don't necessarily make a clear separation between what it is that they're actually trying to achieve by sharing information. And I think that really becomes a critical gap when you then look at you know what, what works or doesn't work in information campaigns. Um, so for example, if you focus more on a humanitarian objective, you would think that in information campaigns that focus specifically on you know maybe origin countries, um, that they would perhaps choose a slightly narrower audience, really focus the information to the individual, um, because that way they can really prevent some of the vulnerabilities further down the line and on the route. Whereas if you look at more of a almost, I want to say, border management approach that many of the European um, governments have kind of in the back of their heads when they're funding these types of campaigns, your activities might actually look quite a bit different. You might be focused a lot more on reach, for example, rather than trying to you know, address specific vulnerabilities of certain subsets of the populations that you're trying to reach. 
So there's this, this gap that we found that if your objectives aren't clear and your methods aren't uh, kind of aligned with your objectives, you automatically end up not doing the best that you can for these objectives and ultimately for the audiences that you're trying to, in quotation marks, you know, save or provide with information that they can kind of rely on and do something with. Um, so rather than looking at, you know, is there a gap um, that there most certainly is, but we found that almost the more critical challenge is the lack of reflection on what the objectives are for those campaigns. And maybe just adding from my side as well, um, it's, a, it's a additional perspective to this. So, so of course, as I also said in the beginning and has been repeated, we are, we are doing our utmost to, to of course uh, preserve that, that mandate and the approach that we have in, in sharing information. But also we are, uh, we are also receiving funding for, for our, our interventions. And we, of course, should be highly uh, aware and, and, uh, and, and make sure not to be instrumental in, uh, in carrying forward information campaigns that exactly has that purpose of uh, discouraging uh, um, um, migration. So it is a, it is a, there are many dilemmas and there are many uh, awarenesses that we need to, uh, to, uh, to have in mind as, uh, as humanitarian actors. And at this um, much more detailed level, also thinking about um, this individualized information, which uh, you, you are talking about uh, building, that that builds trust in the relationship. But of course, that is a, a hugely uh, resource uh, demanding approach, maybe. But it is something that makes, uh, made me reflect at least how, how in any case we could, we could bring some of those uh, thinking into our programs that usually have a, a very large scope, but a, a very good, very um, yeah, taking it back to the to the aspects of the the gap of information. For sure, it is a, there are some uh, some different objectives, and we are we have different mandates, and we are we we really need to preserve those and and be very mindful of how we interact and and how we we are perceived in uh, in in accompanying or. Um, or collaborating in in uh, in approaching and and uh, and um, providing services and uh, and information to uh, to the people that we are there for. Thank you, Sina Hu. I I think I'll just keep you there because we have uh, a question. I think uh, you can elaborate on uh, in in the same topic. So the question goes: Why taking as a starting point this idea that humanitarians should improve? the way they provide information to migrants, since it seems very clear from this report that migrants are already well informed, develop their own information strategies along the way and distrust these actors for pursuing ambiguous purposes. Would not all the resources mobilized by international NGOs for these information activities in West Africa be better used to promote migrants' rights and access to safe routes on the political stage? I think uh, that is a, a good question of reflection. Um, I think what we uh, we uh, encounter are needs on along these routes, and we are acting on those needs. And if information uh, can uh, can help make better informed choices, because now it's claimed that you they that that everyone has the the, the information that they need. Nevertheless, we find that people. Uh, find themselves in very difficult uh, situations along the uh, along the way, where we have uh, an obligation and opportunity to uh, to uh, alleviate or to to help um, people in these situations. So I would I think I would question whether whether enough or uh, the right information is at hand. Um, but I I'm sure that looking at this uh, area critically we would be able to, to use resource better and design programs that maybe have less focus on large information campaigns, but rather in a different way, try to reach people that need information to make, uh, to make the right uh, decisions. So um, yeah, thank you for the question. Thank you. 
maybe a, a last question, uh, Gabriella, before closing, or how is how we how are we on time? We are almost at time, so yeah. if it's a really quick one, we can fit it in. I think there's uh, well, there's an, a question regarding um, opinion on apps for migrants. Uh, maybe Ida, you can quickly answer to that. And there's also something related to the trend of IUM and other international organizations using popular musicians to do songs and music videos to warn against irregular migration. Have you looked into uh, how uh, would-be migrants perceive this? Yeah, let me first comment on the, on the apps. I haven't looked specifically at this, but just from our study, we can see that uh, migrants, again, they, they use the, the sources they know and trust. And I would, uh, I would doubt that they will easily download an app unless they really saw an advantage of uh, what this app could, could, uh, could do for them. Also, mobile phones are lost and stolen in route. So we have to consider that as well. They are also used, as we show in the report, uh, sometimes to even, uh, even um, how you say um, that distort uh, or no, no you say um, yeah uh, so people so so uh, smugglers for example call family members and they have to pay ransom to get them out so so uh, yeah it's it's not so easy and I don't know if apps is the way uh, forward when it comes to musicians I, I, I can just say from a Senegalese context there have been uh, different mixed receptions of using uh, musicians, for example, um, in Senegal, people would be critical of uh, uh, popular musicians that travel around the world and play, that they suddenly come and say you should stay at home and don't go migrate when they all the time travel around and can be globalized citizens, which many inspire to be so too. So uh, it's not just uh, easy, but of course a catchy tune. We know that from other campaigns, health can campaigns, can can influence at least I think the discussions, but how much? Yeah, I, I don't think we have uh, measured that properly. Yeah. Thank you, Ida, and I think I'll give the floor to to Gabriella. Thank you so much, Helen, and thank you so much to all of you for joining us today. We think that the conversation was very productive and. More than anything, it forces us to think beyond traditional and way mechanisms um, in which we have thought about assistance. It also, I think it is a very good um, starting point or discussion, you know, point on how we ourselves as people who work in academia, who work as humanitarian uh, workers or international organizations, how we see migrants ourselves in, as people in need of support in ways that may be paternalistic or condescending to people who have the, the capacity to think and to rationalize. So thank you so much to all of you for joining us today. And we very much look forward to you joining us at the next event. And thanks to all of our uh, discussants. And of course, congratulations to the researchers for an excellent report. Thank you so much. <laughs>